Chef AJ here for Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm solo today, so I will wait to make sure that somebody's on and that this is working before I start. Ah, one person, great. If you wouldn't mind just typing two people in the chat box that you can hear me. Okay, hi Amanda. I'm guessing that you can hear, ah, thank you Carrie, all right. So we will get started. Hello, Jennifer. I'm going to have to keep going up. It's hard to see. Hello, Laura. I'll just say hello to you guys, Sam. There's, there's no topic, so we'll just say hello. So before I go get started, hi, Colleen. I always tell you where I'm going to be. Hello, Beth. I'll just say hello today. I don't have Kenny. Susan can hear me great. Hi, Debbie. All right. I'm just going to say hi to you guys today. That's all we're going to do is say hello. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Misty. This really goes fast. Hi, Sandra, or Sandra, sometimes it's pronounced. Hello, Sherilyn, that's a pretty name. Hi, Janice. All right, I'm gonna have to stop saying hi at some point if I wanna get started. So usually before we get started with Weight Loss Wednesday, hi, Huda, I tell you where I'm gonna be. Hi, Allison, and I am going to be at the end. Hello, Debbie. <laughs> Thank you for saying I look nice. It's, I think it's blue, I think blue's my color. Hello, all the way from Canada. Hi, Shirley. All right, let's just say hi. Let's just say hi today. Forget Weight Loss Wednesday. No, but I want to tell you where I'm going to be. So hi, Liz. If you are in the Los Angeles area, hi, Katie, or willing to travel, I'm going to be at the Engine 2 Conference. Hi, Kathy. That is in Pasadena, California on March 25th and 26th. Saturday and Sunday of next week. Hi, Nancy. I'm going to be doing a cooking demo both Saturday and Sunday. Hi, Judy. And on Sunday, I'm going to be giving my favorite talk called The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. Hello from Bakersfield. You could take my class. You're close. Wow, Atlanta. I was just there. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Teresa. I usually go back after the broadcast and then, you know, put a like just to say, hey, thanks for being here. So that's where I'll be. If you need to register, you can still do so with the code ChefAJ50 for $50 off. The next week, www.hygiena.healthfest.com in Marshall, Texas with Dr. John McDougall, Mary McDougall, and Dr. Craig McDougall. Hi, Danielle. And then the next week at the Oaks in Ojai, which is wonderful. Hi, Karen. Hi, Gail. I'm funny. Okay. You know, I'm not really feeling great today, so a uh, I apologize if my energy is a little low. I had some major dental work done and uh, can't take anything for pain because I just, I'm allergic to everything. So that's where I'll be, but you know where I'm going to be in June and you need to put this on your bucket list. Oh, thanks for the hearts, guys. And please feel free to share these broadcasts. Hi, Deanne. I am going to be at Rancho La Puerta in Mexico, and that is probably the greatest place in the world. Hi, Eng. It's been voted by Condé Nast the number one spa destination for many, many years in a row. They have, oh no, I can't see you, says something went wrong. Well, let's see if anybody else can't see me. Sometimes it's, it's on your end, I can see me. So they have discounts in the summer when it's hotter, so please consider going there as well. So before we start the Weight Loss Wednesday broadcast, well this is part of the broadcast because other people have asked this many, many times about salad dressings, because as you know, I promote, good, Huda says she can see, I promote a whole food plant-based diet free of sugar, oil, salt, and gluten. And processed food. Thanks, Megan. So I get a lot of questions about salad dressings. I make my own. That's what I do. I'm a chef. Thank you for, about my teeth. And But the dressings that I make need rec refrigeration once I make them. So I travel a lot, and so sometimes I'll travel with salad dressings. And so Forks Over Knives has come up with three salad dressings. And yes, they're expensive because glass is expensive and they have to be shipped. Hey, from Texas, and that's the only way they do them now, but I'm just gonna show them to you. And again, if you don't wanna use these, you don't have to. You may not agree with all the ingredients, but there are people out there that are not food addicts. They can have a little bit of concentrated fruit juice, and this is the best we've got so far, guys. It's the only dressings I've seen that are sugar-free, oil-free, and salt-free. Now, somebody told you in my class on Sunday that Bragg's makes one apple cider vinegar dressing that may fit that description, and I will make an effort to look for it in the store. But in the meantime, there is sesame tahini. I will read the ingredients for you so you can know. Orange juice, white grape juice concentrate, rice wine vinegar, sesame tahini, which is pure ground sesame seeds, ginger, lemon juice. It's two tablespoons serving, 40 calories, one gram of fat. So that's this one. And the other one is the pomegranate tarragon. And that is 35 calories for two tablespoons, no fat. It contains pomegranate juice, white grape juice, white wine, vinegar, sherry vinegar, and tarragon. 
And then my favorite one is the balsamic fig. 30 calories, it's actually the lowest in calories for two tablespoons. It has balsamic vinegar, that's probably why I like it best, fig puree, white grape juice concentrate, apple juice, and ginger. So again, there's no prerequisite to having to have these to eat a healthy diet, but for some people these are gonna be better options. Uh, when I travel, I'll take a bottle with me in my suitcase because I'm not gonna be able to make homemade dressings at my destination and I, I like them. And I only use a couple tablespoons on a huge salad, so I'm not worried about the small amount of fruit juice. If it's a problem for you, use a lemon, use a lime, think of another dressing you could use, or just use balsamic vinegar. This is Bimon Paz. This is one of my favorite flavors, the cilantro garlic. And with my name, Chef AJ, she'll give you 10% off at www.bemandpas.com. What's in my homemade dressing? Oh, amazing. It's I'm gonna actually be shooting a webinar this weekend, Dr. Gustavo Tolosa is coming in from Dallas to do a bunch of uh, filming with me and you need to make sure you're on my mailing list at www.eatonprocess.com so you can be notified when we do this uh, this webinar but I'm doing my new dressing it's called barefoot salad dressing because everybody says that tastes it it knocks their socks off and I actually served it to the forks over nice people and they they really loved it and it's it's my favorite dressing and it's it's I would have called it house dressing but I already named something house dressing and then I made the mistake of naming something house dressing 2.0 this should have been the house dressing so uh, Biman Paz sesame yeah all of Biman Paz flavors and by the way if you go to the engine 2 conference in Pasadena chef Terry from Biman Paz will be there with all 30 or 40 of her flavors so you can taste each one all right, so hello, Jennifer. At this point, I'm gonna just start answering the questions so I may not see some of your comments, but I always make an effort to answer them afterwards. And please feel free to share these broadcasts. And if people wanna know more about this topic, I recommend episode 18, where I do the frequently asked questions. And you can always find these on YouTube if you subscribe to my channel, which is Chef AJ. I try to get them out within 24 hours. Wow, Denmark, that's fine. So here we go. Welcome to Weight Loss When, Weight Loss, Weight Loss. I can't even talk because of this dental work. Take two. Welcome to Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. So we'll get started. It's just, it's just not fun without Kenny. He had to work today. Gosh, go figure. All right. So the, I don't really look at these until like five minutes before because I want to, I want to be able to answer them extemporaneously and not, not, not that I don't want to give them thought, but I don't want to think about them too much because then it doesn't feel genuine. So this is from, oh, before I answer, sorry about that, I'm getting a lot of questions that you are asking me that are really questions for Dr. Lyle, Dr. Goldhammer, and Dr. McDougall because you're sending them to my husband and you're saying, this is a question for Dr. Lyle, this is a question for Dr. Goldhammer, this is a question for Dr. McDougall. And while I consider all three of these wonderful gentlemen my mentors and my colleague and my friend, I, I don't have that kind of relationship where I can just like be calling them up. I mean, I actually kind of do with some of them. But the point is, is you need to ask them these questions. So they're all accessible. Dr. McDougall's website is drmcdougall.com. Dr. Goldhammer's website is healthpromoting.com and if you fill out the online health questionnaire, he gives you a free 20 minute consult. And Dr. Doug Lyle's website is esteemdynamic.org. Now the other thing is, is Dr. Lyle has a weekly radio show, I believe it's called Beating Your Genes, and I, I know he takes questions on that, so that would be another way to ask a question of Dr. Lyle without booking a consult. Yeah. I need a Chinese chickenless salad, oil-free sesame dressing. Um, yeah, I would use the Biman Paz sesame ginger vinegar for that, balsamic vinegar. That's what I would use for that. So, okay. So, Naomi, the question that you asked about starvation, I'm actually interviewing Dr. Goldhammer this week because we have an advanced study group for the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. The people that take the program in person were doing a book club based on the pleasure trap. So both Dr. Lyle and Goldhammer, Dr. Goldhammer are speaking in my living room this Sunday. So I will ask him because I really want to know the answer to this question. It's about fasting and bringing the metabolism down. I think it's a great question that I want to know the answer to. So I'm going to ask him that and get back to you next week on that one. So Elise and Estella, I'm both have similar similar questions because they're both saying that they're they're having trouble losing weight and Estella is for the last month and a half no overt fats starch based tons of raw and cooked vegetables and starches from basically potatoes sweet potatoes rice and oats she says she hasn't lost a pound she wants to lose four to eight pounds 
Thank you for my amazing work. You're welcome. And Elise says that she's been struggling with her weight for the longest time. She's joined UWL. Don't understand because she's doing all this exercise. She's 48 years old. Her diet is mainly potatoes, lentils, tons of vegetables, three fruits a day, usually unintentionally practicing IF, intermittent fasting, stops eating at eight. It's frustrating. Uh, what do I do? Is it stress? I overeat. I have super big meals. Please help. So it would really help. But it, well, if you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which uh, Elise, you're saying you are, I need to see a three-day food diary. So I need to see the totality of your of your diet. And that would really help me at least to see the last three days. Because it is possible to overeat on whole natural food, free of sugar, oil, and salt. It's possible to do that. What it's really difficult to do, though, is to gain weight eating foods to the left of the red line because the research that's been done in places like Penn State University by Dr. Barbara Rolls, where she studies human eating behavior, is that if people keep their average calorie density to 567 calories per pound or less on average, almost everyone can eat ad libitum as much as they want, as often as they want, whenever they want, until comfortably full and people don't gain weight at a calorie density that low. It's the foods to the right of the red line that Americans eat 92% of their calories from, like animal products and processed food, like the avocados, nuts and seeds, the, the healthy but high fat whole plant food, the processed foods like the sugars and flours and alcohols, and of course the animal products, and of course worse at 4,000 calories a pound is the oil. And so I've never, I've, you know, I've only worked with a few thousand people, but Dr. Alan Goldhammer has worked with over 30,000 people now in the 32 years since he founded the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, and they all eat this dietary style that I recommend on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that is written about in the book, The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss, and no one has ever gained weight on this eating style, and people that needed to lose weight did lose weight. That said, people eat for many reasons outside of hunger and survival, and if you're overeating, it's possible to not lose weight if you know eating to the left of the red line. And so while we don't want you to have to weigh and measure your food, one of the techniques that we recommend, and which they teach at True North, and which I do, not because I'm trying to lose weight, because I learned it and this is how I enjoy my food more and my husband does it to some degree too, even though he's thin and not a food addict, is sequencing the meals. And that is why it is so crucial that if you are in the, well, you know, I don't want to say if you can do this even if you're not in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we do vegetables for breakfast. We start our day not only in a savory way, but with the food that is most dilute in calorie density, which are vegetables. So non-starchy vegetables, which are pretty much every vegetable except for potatoes and sweet potatoes and winter squashes, which are, you know, potatoes and sweet potatoes are tubers, and corn, which is technically a whole grain, and peas, which are technically legumes. There's, I read the list last week, there's over 30 different non-starchy vegetables. You can eat a different one every day without repeating. But these are the foods that are most dilute in, in caloric density. They range from 67 calories per pound for things like eggplant, okra, tomato, bell pepper, cucumber, zucchini, and wait, zucchini, zucchini, cucumber, tomato, bell pepper, cucumber, okra. These are fruity vegetables. These are fruits, but they're classified as non-starchy vegetables. These are 67 calories a pound. And they go all the way up to maybe about 125 calories a pound for things like sugar snap peas. So the average caloric density of vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, is 100 calories per pound, assuming you don't put things on them like oil or butter or cheese. So you really can't overeat on these. And the idea is, is your stomach is like a tank. It's like a gas tank. Your, your gas tank holds Mine holds 10.7 gallons of gas, and most of our stomachs, unless we've had like a procedure like gastric bypass, holds about a liter of food, which is 4.22 cups. And so you need to have your stomach full in order to feel full, to feel satiated. And that's the problem I have with these weighing and measuring programs because that is not enough food for me per meal to fill my stomach because I, I know what I need in terms of volume. And so we're practicing volumetrics, Dr. Roll's work, where we're filling it with these foods that are high in volume, high in water, high in fiber, but very low in calorie density. And so I'm a big proponent of eating in order of increasing caloric density because then you fill up on fewer calories first. And it's not to say you just eat fruits and vegetables at low caloric density. While there are people in the world that do, I just interviewed one person that does that, Ravi Barbero of The Mindful Diabetic, 
he needs to eat a lot more calories and a lot more fruit because he's not eating the starch and the high fat plant foods and animal products. But you, 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 you start putting stuff in that tank first, so you start to activate those stretch receptors. You fill those up first, but then for satiety, to satisfy your hunger drive, you want the more calorically dilute and delicious foods, things like the fruits, things like the whole grains, the beans, the lentils, and of course potatoes and sweet potatoes. And so people have no trouble eating fruit and oats for breakfast and I don't think that's a good idea, especially if you're a food addict because you're basically starting your day with dessert. Because when you realize that food addiction is refined food addiction, sugar, flour, and alcohol, and you stop eating flour and bread and pasta and you stop having sugar real and fake, you turn to the rolled oats and the fruit basically because now that's your cake. And I'm not saying you shouldn't eat it, but you want to eat your vegetables first because you want to fill up on the fewest calories. So you start getting those satiety signals sent to your brain that you know you're starting to get full and chewing increases satiety and vegetables are something you really have to chew, especially if you don't want to get gas from them. And then you add the more calorically dense starches, or whatever your favorite starch is that you can, and, and we're not saying, when we say vegetables for breakfast, first of all, we're not saying it has to be first thing in the morning because hello from Michigan, many of us that follow the Ultimate Weight Loss Program have learned to get in touch with our true hunger signals. So we don't eat breakfast at 6 a.m. or whatever time we wake up, we wait until we're hungry to eat. And for many of that, us, that hunger may not come till 10, 11 o'clock in the morning or noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. But realize that no one could have ever become overweight or obese eating outside the demands of true hunger. And it's the animal products and the processed food that have no fiber, that have no water, that leave you hungry all the time. Until you get enough fiber in your diet, you're always going to be hungry. But it has to be fiber with water. So for instance, you can't just eat air pop popcorn or rice cakes and be satisfied. Yeah, there's fiber in there, but there's no water. And you can't just drink water because water has no fiber. And so the key to the kingdom for feeling full on fewer calories and being able to eat ad libitum to satiety of these delicious myriad whole plant foods is to make sure that everything you eat has both fiber and water intact because fiber plus water creates bulk and bulk is what creates satiety. So the problem with things like dried fruits is they have fiber but they don't have water. So that's the thing about juices too. Juices have water, but they don't have fiber. You want the fiber and water intact. So I don't sequence my meals to the degree where I like eat my vegetables, eat my starch. I mix my foods, but I always have a foundation of some calorically dilute food first when I first start experiencing hunger. So for breakfast, that would probably be a couple of pounds of non-starchy vegetables. And that'll keep me full maybe on a spin day for 20 minutes, but usually for about an hour. And then I will eat a more substantial meal like the potato waffles, or my favorite, which is a roasted Hannah yam, but I'll also eat that with more steamed vegetables, like another pound of broccoli. So I'm combining the starch and the vegetables, which to me tastes really good together, but I've already started filling the tank so that instead of my stomach needing 4.22 cups of food to feel full, well maybe now it only needs two cups to feel full. So I would ask you if you are sequencing your meals, because you really can't be overweight just eating starch. I mean, look what happened to Andrew Spudfit Taylor. One year of eating nothing but potatoes, as much as he wanted, he lost 120 pounds, reversed his food addiction and his depression. So I don't have a problem with people just eating starch, but if you're not losing weight, starches are four, five, and 600 calories per pound, and steamed veggies sound so blah. Well, you know, they sound blah, because you're used to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in your brain from eating high fat, high calorie processed foods and animal products. But when you eat the diet that I recommend, then everything tastes delicious because you've neuroadapted. So you can pretty much tell how bad somebody's diet is and how addicted they are by how bad they feel the vegetables taste. Because for those of us that have been doing this for a while, um, if, if you can't eat greens in the a.m., then eat a different vegetable. Can you eat cherry tomatoes? Can you eat a cucumber? Can you eat a piece of jicama? Yeah, so the more somebody loves vegetables, especially at the beginning, usually the better, not I want to say the better they're going to do, but the quicker they're going to do it. It seems like the more people resist the concept of vegetables, especially if they're overweight, the, just the, probably the longer it's going to take because all the studies show that the more vegetables that you eat, 
can lower your body weight and BMI. This study was done at Tufts. You can go into the medical literature, Medscape or, or PubMed or JAMA and Google this study. The more vegetables you eat, consistently the lower the body weight and BMI. If you look at cultures around the world that are leaner than Americans, like Asians who have a 3% body weight, they have a uh, always eaten vegetables. They eat lots and lots of vegetables. And you know, this is not a cooking show, but if you want to make them taste good, I've given you many, many ideas. I have probably 65 YouTubes under the Chef and the Dietitian. I do all these free webinars where I show you what I eat in a day and a week and how I make my salads. I mean, I know how to make vegetables taste delicious because I just did a cooking class where pretty much all I made was vegetables and this was for regular people and they ate it and they loved it. But you have to realize that at only 100 calories a pound, you're not getting a lot of dopamine in your brain from eating vegetables. And if you're using food to medicate and celebrate, which is what most people do, you know, cup of coffee in the morning to bring you up and a glass of wine at night to bring you down and candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream, even if they're vegan all day, if you're medicating with food, you're never going to get a hit of dopamine from vegetables like you do from everything else you eat. So when you say they sound blah, what you're really saying is, well, I'm a food addict and I need my hit of dopamine and I know I'm not going to get it from 100 calories a pound food. And you're right, you're not, you're not. And that's why you need to find other ways to get your dopamine. You've got to find other interests and loves in your life than, than just food. And there, believe me, there's many, there's many out there that you can actually discover. So love my mushroom chili, thanks. So, so that's the deal. If you're not losing weight, think about sequencing your meals. And you know, it doesn't have to be steamed vegetables. It could be a soup. It could be a, like, especially if you have a Vitamix, you could be throwing your vegetables in and in three minutes you'll have hot. And soup is different than smoothies because when you have a cold smoothie, it's usually fruit-based and too much sugar too quickly and but vegetables it's so different to your endothelial plus if it's a hot soup you're not chug chug chugging it down like you are a smoothie so you can have a hot soup or you could just have a salad it can be a raw salad it doesn't have to be steamed vegetables but i showed you how to make even brussels sprouts a vegetable that a lot of people don't like taste delicious on episode 107 of healthy living with chef aj on foodie tv doing the balsamic dijon glaze and I didn't even like mustard or Brussels sprouts, but somehow together, if you use the right vinegar, it makes every vegetable taste delicious. So that's a whole nother subject about why you don't like vegetables, but it basically has to do with low, low caloric density. We're genetically hardwired to prefer the taste of sugar, fat, and salt, and foods of a higher caloric density for survival. But in nature, the, we never got these foods of high caloric density, certainly not every day. Sure, there were nuts and seeds and avocados. No, you can have berries at breakfast, but eat your vegetables. See, a lot of the questions you're asking, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make you join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, but these are discussed almost ad nauseum in, in the program, and I try to do my best to give you glimpses of it here. There's a page on my website, eatonprocess.com, devoted to Ultimate Weight Loss Program, where there's four videos, and this is explained even more. So you can eat whatever you want at breakfast. You can eat whatever you want all day long. This is not a court ordered program, the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, although for some people I think it should be. But the idea is, is if you are a food addict, which is refined foods like sugar, flour, and alcohol, the last thing you want to do is activate that sweet taste so early in the day, in, with, in my opinion, with fruit, and with fruit and grain. You want to start your day in a savory way. So if you want to eat oats, eat oat groats instead of steel cut or rolled oats or instant oats and eat them savory with shiitake mushrooms and kale and nutritional yeast and onion and garlic. We go over this a lot every week. So you can do whatever you want, but it really does seem to build self-esteem in people to have a habit like vegetables for breakfast. As I mentioned, my husband, who's six feet tall and he was 160 pounds before he became vegan. He's 142 now. He just can't keep weight on because that's his genetic makeup, his metabolism. He eats vegetables for breakfast, not because he's trying to lose weight, because he realized that if he eats them first, everything else he eats the rest of the day is going to taste more amazing. And if he waits, he's never going to get back to it. See, we prefer foods at a higher caloric density because they release more dopamine in the brain. It's okay that you're late, Hillary. And once you eat fruit and oats, you're not going to go back and eat your vegetables. You know, it's like if you start, I used to eat dessert before I would eat entrees, so I never ate entrees. I actually wrote in my book on processed, life is uncertain, eat dessert first. We well, see how that worked for me. I ended up weighing 200 pounds with the beginning of colon cancer. But now that I understand caloric density, you want to eat the most calorically dilute foods first. Uh, which of the websites would be easiest to start with? Eatunprocessed.com is my main website, and then we have different categories, like we have all the webinars, half of which are free and wonderful. We have the Ultimate Weight Loss page. And um, Okay, so 
So Elise and Estella, I need to see a food journal because I need to see what you're eating and I need to know if you're sequencing it. The other thing is, is are you guys moving at all? I know, I know Elise says he's, she's exercising a lot, but you know, it, it's not just the food. I mean, the food is the most important part. You can never out train a bad diet, but I'm a proponent of moving your body and that doesn't mean hitting the gym, but at least taking a walk for 30 minutes a day in the fresh air and in the sunshine. So you got to be moving too. So as far as overeating, if you're overeating, a lot of times it's because you're not eating enough starch and you're not eating enough starch early on. That's one reason people overeat. Sometimes people wait till they're too hungry to eat. And the other thing is, is people eat for emotional reasons all the time. And if you're looking for dopamine from these foods at a lower caloric density, you're probably not going to get it. And so you're probably going to eat more because what you're looking for is these feel good brain chemicals, you need to find other ways to feel good in life, you know? There, you know, other ways you get dopamine is sex and exercise, but I do believe volunteer work. No, I don't think stevia is ever okay. And we've talked about this on multiple episodes that the fake sugars are actually worse than the real ones, the stevia, the erythritol, and the xylitol, because not only are they a GI nightmare? Every gastroenterologist I have interviewed said they completely mess up your microbiome. Is the fake sugars because they have no calories perpetuate your desire to eat more sweets? And again, I, I don't want to say it's not okay. It depends what your goals are. If your goals are weight loss or to overcome food addiction, then I don't recommend that. And dates are 1300 calories a pound and for most people that are sugar addicts they're not a good food so I don't recommend those yes please join Anita um, I can actually I think I have your email because you attended healthy taste of Sacramento so you know so that's one of the tweaks we do if you feel that you're eating a perfect diet and not losing weight the other thing is is when's the last time you had a physical have you had your thyroid checked and don't worry that if you're hypothyroid you can't lose weight I was hypothyroid the whole time that I lost these 50 pounds it just took me longer. It took me 27 months, whereas other people have lost weight, lose weight much more quickly that aren't hypothyroid. But that might be something you want to get checked for sure. And are you really being honest with what you're eating? And I'm not saying that you aren't, Elise and Estella, but you know, Dr. McDougall has said many times that dieters are liars. And I'm not saying you're lying, but a lot of times they underreport what they're eating. And so while you may be eating the perfect foods, how are you eating them? Are you eating them at somebody else's house that may be preparing them with oil and salt that you don't know about? Are you eating these foods at restaurants where there's residual oil? So that's why it's so helpful when you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that we can really solve this problem together. But I do need to see a food diary. Now, um, Estella, you want to lose four pounds. It's a lot harder to lose four pounds than 40 pounds. And I know this because I work with clients that are professional models and actresses that are leaner than me, but because of the way show business is and the camera adding 10 pounds, they need to lose these four pounds to fit into the costume or they don't work. And it's harder. It is harder because you really have to then pay attention to caloric density and really be sequencing your meals. You really have to learn to stop eating when comfortably full. I just interviewed someone today named Dr. Nick Delgado who talked about this concept of haribachi boo, haribachi boo or something like that, a Japanese uh, concept, uh, concept where we eat until 80% full. Well, I said to him, I said, I don't know that I'm 80% full until I'm 100% full, so how do you know? Well, you eat mindfully. You don't eat in front of the TV or while checking email and certainly not in the car. You pay attention. So you slow down. You chew every, I don't know if you necessarily have to count and chew every morsel of 40 bites, but like Dr. Clapper says, chew your food into a cream. We need to slow down. We need, and so those things can help, especially if you're really goal, close to your goal weight. You know, the closer you are, the harder it is to, it's going to be, be to lose those pounds. And then you really have to tighten the screws and tighten up on the program. You know, what's interesting about me and is almond milk, I don't think any liquid is okay for, um, uh, that's good for weight loss. And that's great, Anita, that you've got the vegetable eating da down because that's the hardest part for most people. So, um, Gosh, well, this is why I need Kenny, because now I've lost my train of thought where I was, and I can't actually rewind right now, but maybe it will come back to me. Okay, I, it's not coming back right now, so let me keep going. So, oh, I know what I was going to say, is, yeah, slowing down is a good reminder. And, 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 you know, sometimes just having a silent meal, I mean, even with your family, one day a week, because, you know, you really aren't always aware of the signals for your tummy telling your brain it's full. They say that it takes about 20 minutes, which 
you know, one, of, one good strategy would be is to eat almost everything. You know, take as much food as you want, but eat half of it or three-fourths of it or whatever. And then get up and for 20 minutes, do some squats, walk your dog, you know, do the dishes, and then come back to it 20 minutes later if you're still hungry, keep eating it. Yeah, 80% full, but see, it's not like a gas tank in here, Heather, so it, it doesn't register as 80% full. It, it's either, for me, it either feels empty or it feels full. So we know what uncomfortably full is, especially if we've had a history of bulimia like I have, or if we've ever eaten Thanksgiving dinner, that's uncomfortably full. But finding that sweet spot of just being full enough and satisfied and finding that balance of starch to vegetables that we all need for health and satiety, that's really the trick. What is the best way to give up sugar? Oh, oh, I think weaning is horrible because that's, that's I, think, I think you're just going to have to suffer for a few days. If you join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we can support you. But I think, um, I think slow is worse. So when you say what is the best way to give up sugar, what is the best way to pull off a Band-Aid that has attached to your skin and now made a scab? Do you go really, really slow and feel the pain every second or do you just go boom, you know? My thoughts on Weight, on weight Watchers, uh, Mary Jane, I would refer you to my YouTube channel, Chef AJ, and you can watch the video interview I did with Dr. Doug Lyle about do we need to weigh and measure our food, and he can tell you exactly what Weight Watchers is, which is a status industry, not a weight loss industry. So yeah, eating to the pain or eating past the pain, and everybody does that. But the truth is, is how many of you really eat past the pain with steamed vegetables? I mean, nobody binges on carrots unless they're not eating any starch or, or they're anorexic. So you really can't do this to the left of the red line, you know? Good for you. Yeah, you still crave sweets? Well, then you're not eating enough greens because if you're craving sweets, this is what you need to do because the research shows that in those bitter taste receptors, they help fight the cravings for sweets. So the more you, you crave sugar, that means the more alkaline you need to be. So using the techniques we teach you in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, using the essential oils, using the green powders, these will help your cravings. You have to understand that cravings are always a sign of addiction. You don't crave anything that you're not, that, that's not an addiction. So for example, if you've never smoked cigarettes in your life, you don't crave nicotine, you don't crave tobacco. Same thing with alcohol. So that, the, the more you have cravings, it shows, it, that just shows you where you are with your addiction, but they can be obliterated through abstinence long term and you can still satisfy your sweet tooth with whole natural foods like sweet potatoes which are very sweet like fruit the whole fruit nothing but the whole fruit when you get off sugar for a long enough time my sobriety date is July 6 2003 I mean when I eat zucchini now it's like it's sweet to me so you know miracles can happen through the process of neuroadaptation but it takes time it takes diligence and it takes abstinence and most people don't give it enough time. As a matter of fact, I read something the other day that in general, whatever it is in life, most people actually quit right before they reach the goal. So Estella and Elise, if you're in the program, send me your three-day food journal, even if you're not, and I'd be happy to take a look at it and we'll see if we can tighten this up to get those four pounds or however many off you want. But the good news is it doesn't sound like either of you are gaining weight, which corroborates the research that you can't eating to the left of the red line. Okay, so... Nasheen says uh, that in Dr. Goldhammer's cookbook, the health promoting cookbook, he uses cornmeal and polenta a lot. And she's trying to understand why it's in the book. She says she's not a food addict, but how would that fit into healthy eating? Is it safe to eat polenta and not get caught in the pleasure trap and get fat? You know, I don't know because I don't know what your genetic potential is for being overweight or obese, but I will tell you this. As far as grains are concerned, if you are a food addict, a refined food addict, we don't recommend any ground grains, whether it's, you know, grinding your oats to a flour or, or arrowroot or any of those things. We don't recommend that. And remember, the food addiction exists on a continuum with different people being more vulnerable, different people being less vulnerable. There's no test for it. Like if we were to do a blood test to see if you're diabetic, there's a, a, a number called the A1C and everybody gets a specific number. It doesn't work that way with food addiction because it can change during your life. For example, when I go to Rancho La Puerta in Mexico and come home blissed out on day nine, you know, I could probably go to a candy store or an ice cream parlor and be like, whatever. But on the day I had my major car accident and having this dental work, I'm going to be more prone to, you know, to, to wanting to eat these foods. So, so that it definitely changes, you know, stress is a huge trigger for cravings and for food addiction. So are all the emotions. If you're lonely, if you're bored, if you're anxious or depressed or tired, all these things can, can perpetuate, you know, the desire to eat 
non-health promoting food. So if you're not a food addict and you're not overweight, it's fine to grind your grains. At True North, they have the classification URN, unrestricted, which are foods to the right of the, to, excuse me, foods to the left of the red line, which we eat on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, ad libitum, things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, gluten-free whole grains and legumes. And then at True North, they have this other category of restricted foods. And these would be things like your pastas, the gluten-free pastas, like the bean pasta or the lentil pasta, things like that. Or, and, and this is where the polenta and the cornmeal would be. These are restricted foods that can be useful for people like children or athletes or people that need to gain weight. And then of course we have, the, and things like nuts and seeds and avocado, these are not never foods, these are restricted in some people. And then the never foods, which are obviously the animal products, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, oil, sugar, salt, and flour, and alcohol, of course. So when you grind a grain, you take a whole grain, and when it's cut with a, a sharp blade, you now have a broken grain. When you have a broken grain and you eat it, you've increased its surface area, which increases the absorption in the intestines, which means that your blood sugar gets raised more quickly and your insulin gets raised more quickly and insulin is responsible for driving fat into the cells. So depending on how vulnerable you are to food addiction, you may not want to do things with ground grains. Now I have one recipe, the, the blueberry millet muffin that I pretty much only eat when I travel. It calls for one cup of ground millet. Now every muffin has four teaspoons of ground millet. For me, these aren't a trigger, but other people say it is. So in that case, we just don't grind the millet or we substitute a cup of whole oats. I think the wholer the food, the better in general for health, certainly the better it is for combating food addiction and certainly the better it is for weight loss because the more food is processed, the worse it is for weight loss and the less a food is processed, the better it is for weight loss. So I did take a peek at the health promoting cookbook by Dr. Goldhammer and there weren't that many recipes with polentas. I think I noticed three or four. So I don't think you have to necessarily avoid it if you are not overweight and if you don't need to lose weight and if you're not a food addict. I mean, you can make some delicious thing for that. I don't think they're necessarily going to be what causes a person to get into the pleasure trap. I think it's the sugar, oil, salt, more, you know, things like cheese and animal products or chocolate, alcohol that have people get stuck in the pleasure trap so that they can't crawl out. But again, our brains are different. Every day is different. So these are things you may have to test for yourself. You know, a lot of people say, well, what do I do to make a gravy? You know, can I use arrowwood? Well, maybe you can. See, I can't feel in your brain to know if you have a reaction to that. I know for myself, I'm very sensitive to the sugars, even though I've been abstinent for sugar all these years. And I've mentioned to you a story where I didn't realize I was having almond milk with sugar. My husband bought the wrong one. The box looked the same. And I didn't end up relapsing or overeating once I caught my mistake. But I remember when I had sugar accidentally, I was, I was just looking around for more food. I had very bad cravings. Now, flour doesn't seem to do that to me in very small doses. And what I mean by that is like a tablespoon a day in a recipe. Now, it's not that I seek it out, but a couple times a year, I make this recipe that is... Uh, it, it, Dr. Gustavo Tolosa did it on the holiday webinar with me. It's a, it's like a French fry recipe, and he omitted the flour when he made it, but it calls for like two tablespoons for the whole thing, and my husband and I split it. I probably had it four times last year. Actually, when Andrew Spud Fit Taylor came over for dinner, I made it with actually potato flour. I can handle that. Could I live without it? Absolutely. Are there other alternatives? Absolutely. So for example, for, for what I do for thickening in recipes that call for arrowroot, I can take some steamed cauliflower and puree it, and then it gives it that depth, that creaminess. I could take a Yukon Gold potato, maybe a small four ounce one with the skin off, puree it so there's ways to do it. You could use white beans. So I'm not so worried from a recipe standpoint. In my opinion, when in doubt, leave it out. If any food you're worried about in your diet, whether it's should you eat dates or should you eat nuts or should you eat arrowroot, when in doubt, leave it out. And then, you know, after you've been clean for a long time, free of refined food addiction, your brain actually gets more sensitive. And for some people, they may react worse than they did. See, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you're drinking alcohol not to feel good, just not to feel bad because you've habituated to a certain amount of alcohol. And then if you get sober and then you drink, the amount of dopamine you get in the brain is even greater. Think about Philip Seymour Hoffman and, and what led to his death. He was abstinent from all drugs for I think something like 23 years and on one day for whatever reason he had a drink of alcohol. Next thing he was using heroin which led to his fatal overdose. So these dopamine receptors that have been um, 
I want to say dumbed down, that's probably not the right word, but, but overactivated, overstimulated, they, they start to heal just like your taste buds start to regenerate. And then if you've been abstinent for a while, you eat it again, sometimes it's even a greater high, which gets you back into the pleasure trap faster than you can say steamed kale. So again, we all are at different points of this journey. We all are more or less vulnerable depending on our unique brain chemistry and how long we've had this disease, how deeply we suffered, what else is going on in our life. So what I say is when in doubt, leave it out. But some of these things like the pastas, the whole grain pastas, gluten-free, the polenta, these are, these are acceptable foods for many people and for children, especially people that uh, don't need to lose weight or are not food addicts. And not everybody is a food addict, guys. When I interviewed Dr. Pam Peek, she said it was something like one in every seven people. The only problem is, is the other six people don't understand it, which is why we have the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which I hope you'll consider joining, because then you're in a tribe of people that you don't have to explain this to, that you can't eat just one, that one bite is too many and a thousand bites is never enough. So that's really why the program was created, because I failed miserably at every version of a plant-based diet until I met Dr. Goldhammer and did the health-promoting diet, which was free of all the chemicals like sugar, oil, salt, and flour that, that artificially released over me in the brain and fooled the brain satiety mechanisms. And now I'm not, and I'm much happier, healthier, and, and, and it's trimmer. But again, you get to do whatever you want, but I hope you'll try this way for you know, at least a week because as hard as it is to get off sugar and how terribly you'll suffer for the first three days, it's so worth it. I've never met anybody that has lost weight that said, boy, I was so much happier when I weighed more or when I had discordant brain chemistry and always craving these, these, these toxic foods. So, you know, give it a try, you know, join the ultimate weight loss program. Give me 21 days. And if you're not satisfied, well, we have 30 day money back guarantee, but I think you need to do it for at least 21 days. 30 is better. 60 is even better. 90 is even better because you know, if you can experience the calm, stable brain and the freedom from food addiction, it feels so much better than the addiction ever did. I promise you, and everybody that's experienced it will promise you. So, you know, it just, you know, it just depends what you want, what your goals are. But if, if your goal is health and happiness and not to be stuck in your pleasure trap, the pleasure trap, your pleasure trap, it might be a worthy goal. So Nasheen also said, similarly, Dr. John McDougall's maximum weight loss, a lot of rice cakes and puff rice. Could you still eat them and maintain your weight? depends. It depends how easily you can maintain your weight. I don't really recommend, I, I mean, I don't run, remember him having rice cakes and uh, puff rice in Maximum Weight Loss book. I could be wrong. I have to go look it up. I know it's in his regular program, but again, in terms of caloric density, uh, th these are 1,800 calories a pound. Rice is 500 calories a pound. And going back to the stomach that we talked about earlier in the broadcast, being about the size of a cantaloupe and holding about 4.22 cups of food, if you, if you ate 500 calories of brown rice, which I've done on many occasions, and I probably will do for dinner tonight because I'm making the Tex Mati rice with the butternut, uh, smoky butternut bisque, your stomach would be full. It, you would activate your stretch receptors, your nutrient receptors, and your calorie receptors. But you take brown rice and you mill it into brown rice flour so that you can make a gluten-free bread or grain, you now need 1,500 calories of that rice to fill the same space in the tank, plus all the other disadvantages just of when you grind a grain, as I mentioned earlier, the insulin and the, the blood sugar going up more quickly. So the problem with the rice cakes and the puff rice for people wanting to lose weight, and especially for food addicts, is that there's no water. And this is why I'm not a fan of air pop popcorn when people say, oh, it's a great snack. Well, first of all, you, should, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't need to snack. If you're eating enough food and enough starch, you really shouldn't need to snack. But I think air pop popcorn is probably one of the worst snacks because there's no water in it. It's 1,800 calories a pound. Corn is only 500 calories a pound. If you've got a corn craving, eat corn on the cob, you know? Uh, what is really hard is living with 100. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It is, it is hard. That's right, Heather. We can decide what's harder. So the thing about the rice cakes and the uh, puffed rice is now we've taken a food and more than tripled its caloric density. So it's, um, can you make polenta at the Instant Pot? I've never done it, Lawrence, because I just, I've, I've never used polenta. So, I mean, I've had it, you know, but never used it. So that's the thing. These foods are of too high of a caloric density for most people to eat in any measurable amounts and lose weight. Some can eat them occasionally and maintain weight. But again, going back to the beginning, if you want to make sure that every, if you are overweight or struggling with food addiction, that everything you put in your mouth has the water and the fiber intact. Water plus fiber creates bulk. Bulk creates satiety. Puffed rice, polenta, 
uh, rice cakes, popcorn, pretzels, tortillas, corn tortillas, a thousand calories per pound versus corn, which is 500, tortilla chips. So again, if you eat your food whole, as it's found in a plant, instead of processed as in manufactured in a plant, you will succeed. Is Jello compliant? I have no idea what Jello is. I know that sometimes it comes from an animal, but why do you want to eat Jello? Because it sounds kind of weird. I, I don't get what Jello. I mean, I know what it is, but you know, I, probably not because Jello is either made with sugar or fake sugar, so I wouldn't recommend either of them. Uh, can I give you p uh, points on having kids eat healthier? I can refer you to my Chef AJ Facebook page or actually on YouTube page, the lecture with Sharon McRae, who is a food coach in Baltimore, Maryland, who helps people uh, transition a diet. So Ellie, the, the way to eat, we've talked about this in previous broadcasts, the way to eat the vegetables to make them taste delicious. And that's why when you join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we give you a 21 day meal plan. So I don't have time to talk about this right now, but you go to my webinar page and you can see me doing all kinds of recipes to make it. Yeah, so Judy was saying seasoned uh, kale, steamed kale with pineapple and cinnamon. That's one way right now. Think, and, and again, any of these vinegars make everything, especially kale, taste delicious. All right, so that's that. Oh boy, I hope we get to everything because I wanted to get to this one that I from two weeks ago, the ease. Okay, so. Um, and your question about doctor about the uh, food availability in uh, in uh, in periods of starvation, I'm going to I'm going to ask Dr. Lyle this weekend. So hopefully I'll have those answers for you next week. So, so Jessica says that from my informative video, she's coming to realize the reasons she may overeat. One is to get the dopamine effect. How do I stop that? I don't know. You probably have to replace it with something else. So most of us in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program exercise, we meditate, we do crafts, we do other things to stabilize our brain, we do volunteer work. So we look to places other than just food to feel good. Relationships, our pets, going for a walk, taking a bubble bath. So that's one of the ways to do it. You know, all eating stimulates the production of dopamine in the brain, but the foods at the higher caloric density stimulate more, which is why we perceive them as more valuable and better tasting when it really has nothing to do with taste, it has to do with dopamine. Some of us are born with what's called low D2 receptivity. We naturally produce less of it, and you usually have that genetic variant if you have addiction in your family. You can see around you, were, you, were your parents very overweight? Do you have any alcoholics or drug addicts in your family? So do other things that, that stabilize the brain, you know, puzzles, crafts, exercise, you know, find ways to enjoy life without food. I mean, food is enjoyable, and it still is enjoyable for us, but it, it's not our main focus anymore. I just want you to know that I think you're extremely inspirational. Oh, you're very nice, Amanda. So I don't, Jessica, I'm guessing you're not in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, but this is what we discuss. I mean, 24 hours a day, either myself or my partner, John Pierre, or somebody, because we have people all over the world, are on those boards to help you and support you with things like that. So yes, that's why everybody eats. I mean, really, food initially was intended for hunger and survival. And the dopamine was the reward to show our ancestors they were going in the right direction. Because if we ate some poisonous berries, they would not taste good. And so we wouldn't eat them. If we ate sweet berries, they would taste good. So we were rewarded with this pleasant hit of dopamine. Same thing for sexual behavior. That was rewarded because the biological purpose of life is to is to pass on our genes, to replicate our genes, to, to reproduce. In order to do that, we have to survive. And to do that, we need enough calories. So eating is very rewarding. Well, in nature, we never got in trouble. Our ancestors were never fat and sick. Well, sometimes they were sick, but not from sick from preventable lifestyle diseases like heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and autoimmune disease. And so, uh, you know, uh, Jessica, if you don't want to join Ultimate Weight Loss Program, perhaps there's a book you might enjoy called The Pleasure Trap, where this is explained in detail. All right, been following. Yeah, well, well, there's nothing wrong with Engine 2. It's a wonderful program, Rip's a wonderful person, and there's nothing wrong with Forks Over Knives. And there's nothing wrong with the Starch Solution. These are wonderful programs that will serve most people very well. But the problem is, is what my esteemed plant-based colleagues don't understand because they're all slender and none of them have ever suffered from refined food addiction, is that there is a subset of people that cannot eat sugar or flour or alcohol in any amount. And because many of the recipes and pro our products are created with small to moderate amounts of sugar, flour, pasta, things like that, we don't thrive on those programs. Now, they're still perfectly fine for reversing the heart disease and the diabetes, no question about it. 
but for overcoming food addiction, we have to take it a step further and be completely abstinent of sugar and flour if we want to meet our weight goals and not, because these things perpetuate overeating in, in, in people in general, but in us in particular. So it's sort of like, I love Dr. McDougall and Engine 2 and Forks Over Knives, Brian and Rip. They, I hate this analogy because, you know, it's, it's, it's fishing, but, but, but when I think about it, you know, you see these, these nets where unfortunately they catch all these fish, you know, and sometimes dolphins and stuff, but you have these large nets and you catch a lot with the nets, but even nets have holes. Not, you know, not holes, but the way it's interwoven. And some of the little fish, they fall through the nets. Now, that's good for them in this fishing context. But those of us with refined food addiction, we, we fell through the holes in the net. And thankfully, Dr. Alan Goldhammer had a program created for people like us. And so did Dr. McDougall, by the way, in his book, The McDougall Pro uh, Program for Maximum Weight Loss. The whole reason the Ultimate Weight Loss Program exists is so that I could marry the best of the plant-based diet nutritionally with what I knew about food addiction from the experts that teach that. The only problem is the people that teach food addictions, well, number one, none of them are vegan. So they're not ethical vegans. They're not any kind of vegan. So that's not even something they personally care about. But they all do the weighing and measuring. And, the, you know, I don't want to keep talking about this. The weighing and the measuring works if you're willing to do it the rest of your life. But most of us don't want to be chained to that food scale. And when you really understand caloric density, really understand it and apply it in your life, you can eat twice as much food. Yes, including potatoes and white potatoes, and yet take in half as many calories. But the problem is, is these food addiction treatment programs require the nuts. They require the oil. Uh, you know, they, and, and, and there's, just, for, there's just not enough food, and there's no starch. It, I mean, some of them will tell you not to eat any starch or four ounces a day. Four ounces a day, I eat two pounds of starch at a sitting. And starch, complex carbohydrates, is the only thing to satisfy your hunger drive. Yeah, I know, I, I, I've never done weighing and measuring, at least not on purpose. I mean, I did it one day when I was having, it was for uh, the urologist, I had uh, some urinary problems and they needed input and output, so I had to write down everything I ate. It wasn't to like, lose weight, it was just so he knew. And I, after one day I said, I'm not doing this. I mean, I don't know how people are not driven crazy by it, but it seems to me that the only people that really sustain weighing and measuring are the leaders of the programs. I don't see regular people doing it, because if they did, I wouldn't get so many people from all these programs. So, but if it works for you, do it. If we know it works, but is it sustainable? And have you tried this other way that Dr. Lyle talks about in the YouTube, do we need to weigh and measure? All right, so, oh boy, this, I, I, this it really does go fast. Okay, so this is from Nancy. And it, it, the, here's the thing, because I'm American, I don't understand uh, the metric system, so I don't know what stones, I know stones are a unit of weight, and I suppose I could have looked this up. So, so tell me in English, if you don't mind. Uh, how much fruit do I recommend a day if you're trying to lose weight? One to two pieces, just like Dr. McDougall. But I recommend the savory fruits, the, the eggplant, okra, zucchini, bell pepper, cucumber, and tomato ad libitum. I eat several pounds of those a day. So um, this is my body, okay, see, now she says her body is her source of her income, and that's important for her to be lean and have lots of energy. She travels a lot living from hotel to hotel. Um, she wants to eat more, but I struggle to do so. So when you say you struggle to do so, see, again, here's the thing. The briefer you are, but the more specific you are, the more I can help you. When you say you struggle to eat more, what does that mean? Are you physically struggling like you're getting too full, or are you mentally struggling because you think if you eat more, you're going to lose weight? Oh, Kathy, thank you. One stone is 14 pounds. So, okay, this I'd still have to do method. Thanks. That's good to know. So, so that would help. But if you're, I, I travel a lot too, and and it is so hard if you travel full time to. It's not that it's so hard. I mean, it's doable, but it's much more difficult when you're not in control of your environment and have to eat at restaurants. I take my instant pot. I now I got an air fryer for my birthday, so maybe I'll start taking that. So that is more difficult. Now you say you've calorie restricted since you were 13 years old and you were obese. So. Again, it would, I, I'm guessing you're not in ultimate weight loss because how could you be obese if you were calorie restricting? And if you were doing it that young, I mean, do, I, you know, I'll just come around and say, do you have or have you had an eating disorder? So, you know, to become your ideal weight, there's also a range of ideal weights, right? Because the ideal weight for a Hollywood model is going to be probably 20 pounds lower than me. And I'm already kind of at the low end of, you know, the Kempner-Furman chart for weight. So... 
you know, we talked about it this at the beginning that to lose small amounts of weight is definitely going to be harder than losing large amounts of weight. If you have 100 pounds to lose, you could be more liberal. You could be including more of these foods and still losing weight. But as you get closer to that goal, you're going to probably have to do something like increase the vegetables, sequence your meals, consider intermittent fasting, or increasing your exercise. You know, we don't have a lot of time left. I wanted to get to those 10 E's that I was telling you about. And if I broadcast next week, I'll do it, whether Kenny comes or not. Next week's my birthday, and I haven't decided if I want to broadcast. It depends if I have to film something else because the light's in the screen. I just, once it's up, I, I, I maximize the time under that. But I want to talk about exercise because it's really important and not for losing weight because the truth of the matter is if you know my story I didn't exercise at all while I was losing weight I wasn't trying to prove a point but my weight loss journey started because of a broken knee on my 50 uh, right before my 50th birthday when I was so fat that I could not even use the crutches or the walker and I had to be in a wheelchair for three months and have my husband help me in the restroom and that was the most embarrassing humiliating thing in the world and here I am like not even 50 years old and it was like being in a nursing home and I was mortified and I was ashamed that I was so fat that I couldn't even use crutches because, you know, a broken knee is bad, but everybody else that has it uses, uh, I don't know what else I make in my air fryer yet because I just got it, I've only made potatoes, but I'm going to try uh, mini bells. So, so what happened is, is that this broken knee, it took a really, really long time to heal and uh, I vowed that I... I was not going to be like this anymore but of course in the wheelchair for three months I couldn't even walk I did gain more weight and when I went to the doctor and he did the MRI and he said yeah you need surgery I turned the surgery down because he said well this is the outcome of the surgery you're either going to get better you're going to get worse or you're going to stay the same and so two of those two of the three outcomes didn't sound appealing getting worse or staying the same but the main thing was is he refused to do it except with general anesthesia of which I have an unnatural phobia having had an allergic reaction when I was 19 so he said to me he goes well have you ever considered losing weight and I said no no never never thought about it you know but uh, he said because every pound you're overweight is like five pounds of pressure to your knee and so that was really the impetus of me getting on this journey and meeting Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle and working with them to figure out what I needed to do to, to lose the weight but as my knee was healing, I still wasn't able to exercise because I was too fat. Because, again, it, it is harder to exercise when you're heavier. That said, you know, you can still take a walk. You can do water exercise. There's things that people can do, even in wheelchairs. John Pierre, my partner, trains people in wheelchairs, and they've got an amazing upper body strength. But I was resistant to exercise. I think that's a little bit partly genetic and I think it's something that's modeled you know my parents never exercised my family never exercised we never took a walk you know so the thing was is after I lost enough weight and my body started feeling better particularly my knee the problem was is because it was a chef and I would stand 10 or 12 hours a day my left knee would swell to twice the size of the right knee but when that started to get better as I decreased my weight that's when I started to exercise and the thing is, is if you look at everybody that they've studied in the National Weight Control Registry, Registry that was founded by James Hill, 94% of the people that kept weight off exercise at least one hour a day. Now, you don't have to necessarily exercise to lose weight. I didn't. I lost, I believe, 42 of these 50 pounds with zero exercise. But you absolutely have to if you want to maintain your weight. So why not get in the habit of daily exercise now? Why not just get a pedometer? You can get them for like 10 bucks at Target or Big Five and just see how much you're moving now and then just try to move a little bit more each day. Whatever you have, even if you're in a wheelchair, there's always something that we can do. And my biggest regret is that I waited so long to exercise and now I've got all this loose, saggy skin that, you know, if I had been building muscle for 50 years instead of building fat, you know, it may not be there. I know that there's a popular theory going around in some of the food addiction treatment programs, the weighing and measuring ones, that we shouldn't exercise while starting a weight loss program. And Dr. Lyle says that's nonsense. It's the exact opposite that's true. The idea is, is that if you're starting a more rigorous food program, that if you exercise, you're going to deplete your willpower and you won't have the willpower for, for doing the program. Well, first of all, that's probably true in a weighing and measuring program because they're giving you so little food. They're making you eat fat and oil every single meal, and they're giving you only four ounces of starch a day, which right there would deplete my willpower just even thinking about it. But the thing is, is Dr. Lyle says that it's the opposite. 
that it exercise actually increases our willpower and increases our ability to stay on a health promoting diet and he talks about how it does this through things like glucose regulation in the brain and things like that the other thing exercise does is it's the easiest and quickest way to raise your self-esteem and if you watch Dr. Lyle at all or go to his website esteemdynamics.org he'll tell you that the number one predictor of self-esteem in a female is their weight so there's no downside to exercise the sooner you make this a habit the better you'll feel and also remember you're giving up some of these foods that up until now produced high levels of dopamine in your brain and so you can't just stop I mean you can you can just stop but then what are you gonna do yeah thanks for agreeing about exercise Susie it is magic and again it's not about being a gym rat I mean I exercise the littlest I can and get the results I want which for me is three spin classes a week I do yoga because I want to not because it's exercise I do something called yin or restorative which it doesn't burn calories it's more for my mind and I, I have a dog named Bailey and I walk her every day probably I'm guessing it's about 90 minutes is when I think about how many walks we do it and an exercise can be cumulative it doesn't have to be one hour at the gym it, it can be five minutes here five minutes there so anyway uh, we are out of time I don't like to keep you guys more than an hour so hopefully next week I will get to the the ease that I've been working on the 10 E's that perpetuate the disease so thanks so much for watching and hopefully we'll have Kenny back if I record next week and please sign up at my website at eatonprocess.com so that you can be on my mailing list because every week we send out a video with some interesting person that I've interviewed and that's also the best way to submit questions if you like this video or the others please share them using your share button right now or on YouTube thank you guys so much for watching I'm chef AJ please check out the ultimate weight loss program because I believe that you really can have both the health and the body you so richly deserve and please come to our live ultimate weight loss conference Labor Day weekend we'd love to see you there thanks everybody